semiconductors are a manufactured product. And obviously, semiconductors use energy to operate. They manage the flow of electricity. So without electricity, without the energy sector, chips are worthless. And in addition to that, a lot of computing power sops up a lot of energy. Now, this stock is down 63% in the last year. It's down to around $117 per share. And we're going to discuss whether there's still hope for this stock after we finally purchased it in, I think, August. Welcome back, everyone. Today, we are going to talk about some energy stocks. We're going to start with Berkshire Hathaway Energy, Albemarle, and then we'll finish up with a much requested company, Enphase, and our take on what is going on there. So let's jump right in. So Berkshire Hathaway, a longtime stock for us and our biggest bet on boring old businesses like financial services, transport, and energy. Berkshire B shares, BRK dot B, is hitting new all time highs. Now, if you remember, Apple is almost half of the stock portfolio, 46%, in fact, as of this recording. But it's not Apple's performance that is driving the stock higher, at least not completely. Rather, we think it's investors' flight back to safety during the pullback the last two months and surging oil and fossil fuel prices. We'll show you a couple charts to illustrate this. We have Berkshire Hathaway and United States Oil Fund, as well as Apple and Berkshire Hathaway. Casey, as you said, I think this is interesting because I think you'd think it would be Apple's stock performance that would kind of pull Berkshire Hathaway stock up or down. Um, but yeah, like you said, I think this is flight to safety. Uh, the Federal Reserve has a lot of people jittery. Um, I think our channel's jittery. It looked like not so many people tuned in for uh, yesterday's rant on the NVIDIA scam thing, because I think everyone wanted to know what the Fed was going to do. At any rate, so I think that's what's going on with Berkshire. And interesting that this chart here, it looks like highly correlated to oil prices. And what I find interesting here, Casey, is oil and utilities, energy overall makes up a very small bit of Berkshire's overall portfolio, both in the stock holdings. So you think of Berkshire Hathaway in two buckets. You have all the public stock holdings that they own, like Apple. And in that bucket, you have Chevron which is about roughly 6% of the Berkshire Hathaway stock portfolio at this point. And then you have Occidental Petroleum. So Chevron, CVX, Occidental, OXY. Occidental is only about 4%. So in total, 10% of that half of the bucket. And then, as you said, Casey Berkshire Hathaway Energy, BHE. We'll just call it BHE from here on out. In full year 2022, I'll use the last full year figure, Berkshire reported $240 billion in revenue in its subsidiary businesses. And of that, Berkshire Hathaway Energy was only $26 billion of revenue. So only about 10% of total sales. And the operating income is a similar story, roughly 10 to 15% of actual Berkshire subsidiary business operating profits, operating income is attributable to BHE. Berkshire Hathaway Energy comprises a long list of businesses. We'll show you a screen graphic here of some of the energy companies that they own. They own a number of businesses in the U.S. as well as Canada, and then they also have one in the U.K. And I will show you another graphic that they provided in regards to their energy asset profile. You can see that the largest portion of their assets are electric transmission and distribution pipeline. That is 66% of their entire profile. And then non-carbon generation, coal generation, and natural gas generation make up smaller pieces of the pie. So they have a wide range of energy profile assets, as well as a very large group of businesses that they manage in the energy sector. Casey, like you said, Berkshire, Hathaway, our long-term bet 
sort of a portfolio ballast, I guess you could say, you know, when you have market turbulence like we've had the last couple of years, uh, Berkshire Hathaway doing its thing, performing well over the last couple of years. And in addition to that, I think this is kind of like our bet, our energy bet, in particular on liquid natural gas. As you mentioned, they have those pipeline businesses, a lot of pipeline businesses, and a lot of experimentation also going on within these different utilities and natural gas pipelines with not just hydrogen generation, but also, as it turns out, it looks like a lot of natural gas pipelines can be repurposed as hydrogen transport infrastructure as well. We've talked about quite a bit here in other videos in the past about air products and chemicals, ticker symbol APD. Much, much newer stock for us, but been buying that a number of times here this year. And so now that is kind of our second bet on energy, renewable energy, next-gen manufacturing and uh, industrial gases. So these are the two, Berkshire Hathaway and Air Products. Also, I might mention too, you know, the manufacturing is actually the biggest segment of Berkshire Hathaway. So we kind of like this duo, Berkshire Hathaway and Air Products. Uh, it's industrial gases segment kind of work together well, we think. Now, Casey, let me ask you, because you put a lot of work into researching some of the renewable energy projects going on at Berkshire Hathaway, which we like, because one thing you can bet on with Berkshire Hathaway is they're probably not going to develop any projects that don't have a very, very clear path to profitability. So I think in decades past, a lot of investors kind of whole hummed about renewable. Oh, it's only profitable if government subsidies get involved. And I think that stigma has kind of been, you know, put to rest at this point. What are some of these projects? You know, these are not a huge portion of, of the BHE portfolio, but the company is investing pretty heavily in, in a number of different initiatives. What's going on? Yeah, Nick, there was a few that I found really interesting. The first one is they've just partnered with West Virginia to build a solar power microgrid that's going to power businesses locating into a new business district with 100% renewable energy. The second thing is they're developing these geothermal power plants near already existing facilities in the Imperial Valley in California, USA. Those plants are expected to be up and running in June 2026. Here's something that I found really interesting because we're talking about Albemarle, a lead lithium miner and processor. BHE is also finding that lithium is, is very abundant in this brine from these geothermal facilities. The demonstration to be able to produce this lithium carbonate from these geothermal facilities will be this year and then up and running and in production as soon as 2024. Another way that BHE is producing renewable energy in their portfolio. So you mentioned Imperial Valley. Is this Salton Sea that we're talking about? Salton Sea in Southern California, like your most favorite place to go on summer vacation ever? I've heard the water skiing is excellent there. That's right, folks. If you want to sneak a peek at Casey in real life, you can find her sunbathing at Salton Sea every summer. No, no way. Nick, you know what that place smells like. But yes, this is exactly where BHE is producing all of this stuff, near the Salton Sea. So that's some interesting stuff going on in some renewable. They also have some wind projects that they've built. And the nice thing about these, I guess, maybe before we pivot here, sorry, is with these renewable projects is they're highly profitable after you make that upfront capital expenditure R requires very little ongoing maintenance thereafter nice cash flow generating businesses and this is on display here we do have this first half 2023 operating income chart here again just to show you uh, yes bhe is a small part of the berkshire hathaway portfolio but and highly highly profitable here and we like their kind of measured bets into some these new things that you're talking about, wind, solar, salt and sea. Casey, you also did some work researching what they're doing in hydrogen as well, which is, it seems like is 
promising renewable energy source that's picking up momentum? What are they working on in the hydrogen front? Nick, their current natural gas lines could be fitted to be used for hydrogen instead. This I found this super interesting about hydrogen because hydrogen is in all sorts of things, but it's compounded with other elements. And so they have to find a way to release the hydrogen atom from these other elements. So just like water, we have two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. So if you want to use hydrogen at for energy, it has to be isolated. Currently, 95% of the hydrogen produced in the United States is based on a process called natural gas reforming. And natural gas contains methane, or CH4, which is one carbon atom, four hydrogen atoms. This process of natural gas reforming is using steam methane, so methane reacts with high temperature steam, releases the hydrogen. And then there's a couple more steps in the process that I isolate this hydrogen atom and produce more hydrogen. But ultimately, this process could be either zero or near zero emissions. And so this is why hydrogen is such a positive and possible opportunity for renewable energy that BHE is looking into. Yeah, they certainly have ample utility assets and those natural gas pipelines to to experiment with yeah a lot of stuff going on in this uh, casey correct me if i'm wrong but collectively all of these utility companies together are one of the largest utilities in the us and the largest renewable energy utility company in, in the united states and in north america yeah that's right nick it is the largest investor-owned company with clean power in operation. And of course, this is chip stock investor, not uh, energy stock investor. But uh, for those of you that maybe are just coming in here for the first time and maybe seeing an energy episode, we talk a lot about uh, adjacent industries that help support manufacturing, including semiconductors. Semiconductors are a manufactured product. And obviously, semiconductors use energy to operate. They manage the flow of electricity. So without electricity, without the energy sector, chips are worthless. And in addition to that, a lot of computing power sops up a lot of energy. One thing that you had mentioned in your notes on this section of BAG, Casey, is cheese utilities are looking also at hydrogen as a form of power for data centers. So. This is a little bit of a fuzzy metric that we've mentioned before, but something like the estimate of one and a half to 3% of energy usage in the US is data centers. And with all these new generative AI servers going into these, you get a ton of more computing power, a ton of efficiency unlocked for businesses potentially, but the byproduct is a lot more energy usage as well. Some estimates point that unless things change, uh, all this new data center compute could go from something like you know a low to mid single digit percentage of energy usage to something over 10% of all energy consumed in the US just for data centers. So that's why we do these energy episodes, just as a, a refresh or if this is your first time catching one of these episodes. Okay, that's BHE Energy. Casey, you already mentioned lithium. Should we talk about some updates going on with, with Albemarle? Yeah, absolutely. So we talked a little bit about how BHE is starting to dip their toes into this lithium production, but Albemarle has been one of our top lithium picks in the last couple of years. This stock has been hit hard, especially with the cost of raw lithium depressed with a low point in April and May of this year. There was a bit of a rebound in the summer months, but we're now back down again. So Albemarle currently down around 15% year to date. Yeah, so the lithium price, this is common whenever you're investing in a raw materials or mining operation. It's not just the supply, the amount of supply that a company is able to sell. You also have to take into account those very, very volatile commodity prices. Two things going on here. 
Uh, maybe I should actually expand this to three things uh, real quick, Casey, as you have the price of lithium uh, up on the video here for everyone to take, to, to take a look at. So the Federal Reserve interest rate hikes over the course of the last year and a half, they're trying to kill inflation and that's starting to work. Base commodity prices have come down a lot. So that's one factor. The second, lithium demand was far exceeding supply through 2022. This is primarily driven because of, of the EV market, electric vehicle market. Lots more EVs being made than in the recent past. And the amount of lithium needed in a car battery is exponentially more than one in a smartphone. But more supply has come online. And a lot of lithium upstarts. Albemarle was kind of a first mover here, but a lot of other companies have picked up on the trend. More supply coming on. So, you know, more of a balance there in the supply and demand, if you remember the teeter totter in your economics 101 class. And then the third thing, and just general ongoing worry about China's economy, China, the largest EV market on the planet, a ton of manufacturing goes on over there, a lot of it for domestic consumption, a lot of EVs being sold in China. But with the economy reopening after some of their COVID lockdowns, it hasn't gone as smoothly as some expected. There have also been some things, you know, incentives from the government pushing consumers towards EVs. Some of that has died down. And so just some growing pains, I think you could say, for this market. Albemarle is doing just fine. Uh, their sales are up. Uh, as their demand increases, they've had no problem selling the stuff. But it's this lithium price dynamic uh, that you're seeing here on the chart, right, Casey? Yeah, I know in many of their investor presentations, they've addressed this lithium pricing head on and they've talked about how that's built into their outlook. They definitely have a plan to deal with all of this volatility. Can you tell us a little bit more about their plan to deal with it? Two things. Some of this has gone away a little bit in their investor presentations, but I know it, it's still happening to a certain extent. Albemarle has these long-term supply agreements with customers, and oftentimes these supply agreements have both a floor on the price of lithium, and they also have a cap on the price of lithium that they're going to sell uh, via these supply agreements. So that's kind of a nice thing. You know, it shaves off, of course, some of the mat profit that they can get during the high point in a cycle like November 2022. But it's also going to put a bottom in place if you have this really dramatic drop in lithium price like we've had the last 9, 10, 11 months. Uh, so that's one thing. And then the second, we've had this flood of new supply come online, lots of upstarts. And the industry is starting to already at this point figure out a way to consolidate some of that. So the other lithium stock that we own if you want to count Berkshire Hathaway a lithium stock, sure, let's, we can do that. Let's call that number one. Let's call Albemarle number two. And then the third one is Livent. Livent, in process of merging with Alchem, a, big, a supplier in Western Australia. They're going to kind of form this raw material mining and lithium refining, fully vertically integrated operation. Albemarle also in process of potentially tying things up with Lion Town, which at the moment is mostly a pre-revenue business. They have a bunch of lithium in stockpile at their site, also in Western Australia. They have an offtake agreement for that that'll start to kick in the second half of this year. But all that expected supply, it looks like if Albemarle's due diligence goes through and everybody agrees on the price, uh, a second bidder doesn't come in and try to outbid Albemarle for Lion Town, it looks like there will be a tie up here. And so we're going to get some market consolidation with some of the leaders you know, of the pack. This seems to be a really vital point, Nick. How does consolidation improve something like lithium pricing for these companies so that they can generate a profit and for shareholders? I guess two ways you could argue this. Some might say this is not allowing for free markets to, to do their best work, but when <laughs> you have big companies that come in and buy up smaller competitors, those, those big ones in the industry can kind of have tighter control over market supply. And so if you have a period where there, it looks like there might be too much supply, they scale back what they're willing to sell to keep 
demand and supply and parity and, and keep that price of lithium up. Uh, kind of like what's happening with OPEC plus right now with, with Russia and OPEC keeping production cuts in place. Uh, you could also argue too, this, this is the way free markets work. You don't want like this wild west situation where you have wild swings in the market where one year prices are sky high. Everybody floods the market with lithium and then it crashes and then you have like a bunch of bankruptcies uh, as a result. You could argue it both ways, but that's basically what's going on here. That's the rationale. There's still going to be plenty of competition out there in the lithium market. It, it appears lots of new projects uh, in the works and being developed, but a little bit of consolidation going on right now with Albemarle potentially getting its hands on Lion Town. I'll briefly just rattle off a number for valuation. It's cr currently trading just under seven times this year's expected earnings per share. Current stock price in the low 180s. Are we adding any more Albemarle to our portfolio at this point? So again, this is a repeat. If you've been here before watching our energy chip stock investor energy edition videos, we keyed you in on this we're targeting 4% allocation to lithium. So we have the other energy stocks, you know, the natural gas slash hydrogen in Berkshire and air products. We're targeting as part of our, the energy portion of our portfolio, lithium, 4% allocated to that. Most of it's Albemarle. We've introduced Livent in there as well. We're now currently at full position. We've been buyers this year again to bring ourselves back up to 4%. If we get some sort of price surge and, and we see that position go to five, six percent, maybe even more uh, of our portfolio because the lithium market rebounds, we're going to shave that back down to four percent. And then conversely, if, if the market declines again and our allocation drops below four percent, we're probably buyers to lift it back up to four percent because our rationale is we see a great deal of lithium demand ramping up steadily and very quickly through the end of this decade, possibly beyond, again, driven by electric vehicles primarily, but also a lot of uh, these renewable energy projects as well need battery storage attached to it because sometimes energy is from renewable sources is produced at non-peak times. And if you want to keep it, for when it is needed, you got to funnel that power into a battery, a big giant battery pack. And there's a good chance a lot of those are going to end up being lithium ion batteries. So those are even bigger than car batteries. So those are kind of the two things that we're looking at over the course of the next, say, decade. And that's why we kind of want this roughly 4% allocation to lithium companies like Albemarle and Livent. If that changes, y'all will be the first to know. Okay, it's time for Enphase. Now, this stock is down 63% in the last year. It's down to around $117 per share. And we're going to discuss whether there's still hope for this stock after we finally purchased it in, I think, August, beginning of August. So, Nick, kick us off. Let's do a refresh on what Enphase does. Yeah, we just talked about Enphase, I think. But yeah, we have to revisit it again. We, we did a post earnings coverage video, but let's recap. So Enphase, you go back a few years, there's a story to how the company got to where it is, but long story short, they invented the micro inverter. So, okay. Hey, we're talking about chip stocks again here, basically, right? Casey, a micro inverter isn't a chip, but it is a semiconductor system. An inverter is a little module that converts one type of electricity to another. And, and I'll keep this very simple because this is not an engineering channel. An inverter converts the DC direct current from the solar panel to AC, to alternating current, which is usable in the home. So what Enphase invented was the microinverter. So there's, a, there's what's called a string inverter, where you just have the one inverter, the little box with the semiconductors in it to convert that DC power to AC. And you have like a whole solar array and it all flows through the one string inverter. The micro inverter is a smaller 
semiconductor device that sits underneath each individual solar panel. And the benefit of this is if you, let's say, have one solar panel go, goes down, it doesn't affect the whole system because it's on its own separate inverter. Uh, or if you have like a shady spot um, in your house during certain times of day because of trees, okay, that's fine. Maybe the rest of the solar array is still working at optimal energy uh, creation. So, you know, that's the benefit of a microinverter. They're much, much more expensive though than your more traditional inverter, but there are benefits there to, to having it. So that, that's Enphase's claim to fame. Um, and they've built out a whole ecosystem around these microinverters though. They have the software for the homeowner to, to kind of manage their system. And they also have uh, battery storage. We'll talk a little bit more about this, but specifically the battery and the benefit of having that. And then electric vehicle charging uh, stations as well. And they also have more recently announced small commercial systems in addition to the residential solar systems that they've built their name on up to this point. One thing that was brought up in the earnings call that we discussed on our, our most recent video about Enphase was the decrease in product sold to the Sunshine States, California, Texas, Florida. And Enphase had seen a significant enough drop in installation in those states. How is that still an issue going forward? Is that one of the reasons we've seen this huge pullback? Yeah, you could argue that's the reason. And there's a trickle down effect here. Uh, much like everywhere else in the semiconductor industry, whenever you have a sudden drop in demand, you can end up with a situation where you all of a sudden have too much inventory out there. And now you need to scale back your manufacturing and tell your, your sellers, your, your channel uh, works off some of the elevated inventory. Well, yeah, you mentioned the Sunshine States in particular mentioned on the earnings call was uh, we're talking about the Federal Reserve again, higher interest rates has affected financing. A lot of homeowners do not pay cash for these. And so higher interest rates have had most definitely had an effect on purchasing of solar systems. And that's hurt, especially Enphase's business in Texas, Florida, and Arizona. Those are the big three. Interestingly, they said California is doing okay, but I think that's going to start creating a bit of an issue as well. California is the biggest market for Enphase at this point. Uh, our estimate is that 20 to 30% of revenue is directly tied to California. And the other thing going on here is this transition from NEM 2.0 to 3.0, net energy metering. So NEM 2.0 put a lot of power back to the homeowner where they could sell a lot of their energy from their solar system back to the utility. 3.0 reintroduces some caps on that and incentivizes homeowners to sell back their power or use their own solar power during peak times. Um, Enphase has developed a way for residents in California to kind of weasel their way around this though, right? Right, Casey, this was addressed on the earnings call as well. Yes, it was mentioned that under this NEM 3.0 in-phase energy system, homeowners with this in-phase energy system could configure the system to automatically self-consume and sell energy at these times when it would be of value to the homeowner. And according to Enphase, the financial analysis showed that with solar and batteries, homeowners can expect to offset their bills by 70 to 90%. And if they paid cash for the system, which, as we already said, many do not, many finance it. But if you paid cash for the system, the payback would be between five and seven years if they use this software to configure the system automatically. Well, that's, a, that's a pretty good investment, right? A five to seven year payoff, I think, is a pretty good return on investment. And then after that period of time, you're like, you're in the black, like you're making money of the solar system. But you mentioned this again, Casey, interest rates are a problem. Um, so suddenly a lot of homeowners, you know, it's not going to be a five to seven year payback if you're financing this thing, because now you have to account for interest payments, which are suddenly quite high again. 
um, because of, of uh, these interest rate hikes. That's one issue um, that's trickled down to end phase. Now you have all this extra inventory in the US and they need to scale back their sell to their installers. That's who their channel sales partners are. These installers and designers of systems, if you ask for a quote for a solar system, you might have uh, an engineering team come over, make a proposal for you, and it might be end phase or it might be someone else on the package, but you know, they have too much inventory now. That's, you know, this is the story with the whole semiconductor industry for the last over a year, all coming up on a year and a half now. That's where end phase is at. But there is some good news. Uh, there's lots of international expansion going on. Yes, I'll run through some of the numbers quoted in the recent earnings call. In Europe, revenue increased 25% sequentially and tripled year on year. The sell through of microinverters in Europe was 13% higher in Q2 over Q1. They're shipping microconverters now to Germany, France, the Netherlands, Spain, Portugal, and Poland. And they're getting these IQ batteries to some of these markets as well. Uh, Australia, they more than doubled year over year. Latin America, Brazil is a big market for them. And they're expanding to even more countries throughout Latin America and Europe. Yeah. And this expansion is twofold as well. Not only are they entering new markets, but also releasing new product in some of these markets. They have a product optimization. Is, is the phrase that's used, but basically designing a product that would be cheaper for some of these markets to, so that it's a more agreeable price for the local consumer. You're not going to sell the same expensive system in California to Brazil or to Spain or wherever. Take your pick. So new markets, also new product launches as well. So not just the inverters that go with the solar panels themselves, but these batteries. And then as the EV market continues to ramp up, I think we'll probably see a lot more of these home EV charging systems go in, which could be a real nice thing for a homeowner because now suddenly you have a place to plug your car in when you get home every day. Um, and then I, this is, I feel like not talked about very often, but I think this small commercial system that they've just mentioned in passing a few times here could be a really big deal for Enphase. It, it could take some time. You know, this is the same financing issue that's going to come up as, as it has with homeowners. But some of my apprehension over the years and looking at Enphase from time to time was, okay, it's just the residential market. It's highly cyclical. It's going to be very dependent on financing. But suddenly, if, if you also get this second win from starting with small commercial projects, I think now we're starting to see a business with all these you know, multiple products. This is not really a niche business anymore. You have some real strong tailwinds propelling the company forward. If you got money from the Inflation Reduction Act, moving people and moving businesses towards things like solar. Long-term, I think Enphase is, is the real deal. That's why we nibbled in August. Nick, I'll just emphasize that Enphase's guidance for the upcoming quarter was not excellent. They definitely are acknowledging that this slump is going to continue at least for some time. But as of right now, the valuation for the stock is 35 times full year 2023 expected earnings per share, 24 times on an adjusted earnings per share basis, and 21 times expected free cash flow. Currently, the stock is around 117 a share. I keep hearing and keep reading that the stock is cheap. Is it? This is the same issue we ran into last year when we were at like peak semiconductor industry bearishness. And it really, I, I should say that it started earlier in 2022 and lasted most of the year. And this is the thing with cyclical businesses like this, it may be a growth business, but it's a cyclical growth business. And so you're going to have these really hellacious gut-wrenching periods that could last two, three, four, if it's particularly bad, more than four quarters. I think we're of the opinion that 
kind of just based on the language used in the earnings call and some of the guidance provided is that end phases slump maybe lasts through the first quarter of 2024, which puts us at about a three quarters of a year slump. How long do I have to wait if I was to buy the stock right now? What am I looking at if I was saying, thinking, okay, now is when I want to get in. This is the bottom. How long do I have to wait for this to make sense? So we think five to 10 years or more, this is a growth story. If you try to wait to bottom feed, this is what ends up happening. The market is going to somehow sniff out when the next up cycle is going to hit. And the stock price can begin rising even as Enphase continues to report some year-over-year declines. You already mentioned the guidance. 550 million roughly was the revenue guidance down from 635 last year. Okay, sizable downturn. So, so you could wait because maybe it gets worse in the fourth quarter and then maybe it gets worse still in the first quarter of 2024. But the market's going to sniff out when the next uptick occurs and the stock's going to start rising. So I think this is why we nibbled in August. It's why we're going to nibble again some point uh, before the end of the year, maybe twice. We'll nibble twice before the end of the year and, and then nibble again in Q1 2024. Assuming that we still think, you know, eventually this thing's going to turn around and start rising again. So that's our approach is we buy in batches, even though things can continue to deteriorate and progressively worse for the business. Because at some point, the market, if this is a growth cyclical business, the market's going to sniff out that bottom long before the bottom is in reality actually in. Well, I think a good illustration of what you're saying, Nick, is last October when we started this channel and where semiconductor stocks were at that point versus where they are right now. It's had huge growth since that time. At that point, it wasn't the bottom, but it sure looked like the bottom. Yeah. And a lot of portions of the chip market still haven't completely bottomed yet. Like we're still looking for it. And yet many of these stock prices are still up anyways, because the market knows the next wave of expansion is right around the corner and you don't want to miss it. So is that going to happen with Enphase? I don't know. We can't be dogmatic about it, but uh, you know, this is one of our renewable energy picks. We like the micro inverters that, that Enphase uh, have developed. Pretty cool technology, and the company's definitely uh, done a lot of work to establish itself as a, we think, a pretty permanent fixture of what's now a much more mature, grown up solar indus industry compared to uh, the Wild West situation in times past. As far as are there any other companies out there that we may like better than Enphase? We would have to maybe say on semiconductor because on supplies chips to eight out of 10 of the micro inverter companies throughout the world. So it's kind of in this instance, it's like a picks and shovels play. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Uh, maybe we'll do an update on on semi here for an energy part two episode. I don't know. On semi is a chip stock. I guess it wouldn't be an energy episode. Let's wrap it up, Casey. I'm done rambling. Thanks everyone for tuning in for our energy episode. We have a lot more coming up next week. We have three cheap chip companies that we think are possibly a buy. So stay tuned for that episode. And then we have a deep dive into the company Corvo, which we have not covered yet. Make sure you subscribe to the channel and don't miss a video. We will see you here again soon at Chip Stock Investor. Happy Friday, everyone. Happy Flamingo Friday.